Good morning, everybody. Something went through my slides, actually, just before I, I came up to see myself a quick reminder. Uh, looking on my iPhone, some of the slides were completely blank. So this could be extremely spontaneous. So hopefully that won't be the case from here. Interoperability and standards is very important. So I'm going to talk about digital collaboration. I'm going to talk about it from a London perspective to make it real and make it practical. But I'm really thinking about how do we reduce the costs of delivering ICT nationally and how do we actually share the innovation, share the assets that we've got amongst ourselves. So um, what I'll cover, uh, a bit of context, where we are in London at the moment, what's going on, where I see things heading. Uh, what's happening to enable the digital capabilities to be shared more in the future. Uh, I'm going to talk about channel shift uh, and the technologies that have been involved in that. Uh, London super cloud, John Jackson yesterday insisted that I had to use that term, so I'll come back to that and explain it. Um, and I want to talk about some different ways of doing shared services or sh sharing technologies. Uh, so I'll talk about something called, uh, what we're calling data analysis as a service, the, the team system. Uh, and then I'll try and come up with a conclusion and hopefully some time for Q&A before we do the interactive voting. So nationally, we spend an awful lot of money on technology. We do essentially the same things, but in different contexts, with different priorities, with different demographics, different people, but essentially it's the same things that we're doing. So the standardise, simplify, share mantra makes a lot of sense to me. But the question is then practically how do we do it? You know, how do we know what is best practice or even good practice? So 400 authorities are all doing the same sorts of things. Now, in London there are a variety of different types of shared services in place. Uh, I've been running Shared IT for New Haven for six years now. Uh, and that's worked pretty well actually. And so the whole corporate back office merged into a shared 1,300 staff entity last year because the IT had worked well. Uh, going first with IT makes sense because you pave the way, you put in the platforms for others to, uh, to, to utilise later. So that's, that's one format of shared services. Uh, the joint committee between two authorities. We've got Camden and Islington doing the same thing at the moment. Um, I think I'm, yeah, I've got a, a list in here actually. So Kingston and Sutton, I know. Uh, we're in the room today. Uh, they take a different approach to shared services. Two boroughs, uh, cheaper transferring and, and sharing capacity, sharing innovation, sharing best practice. Uh, and they've got lots of other partnerships with other boroughs that the technology supports. Triborough uh, has taken a slightly different approach and they're evolving that at the moment. In fact, it seems that the IT bit is the main part that has stuck, uh, which is becoming a combined entity for the three boroughs, supporting social care activity in particular. But that's evolving. Uh, we've got Wandsworth and Richmond, which is the latest one to be announced, and that, that's really interesting too. So that's a complete merger of the two authorities from the Chief Exec down. And over the next five years, that's going to achieve the whole council's, both councils' efficiency savings in full. Uh, I wish you and Havens were um, that small, if you like. I've got to make £50 million pounds worth of savings in the new next year, rising to £92 million, uh, by 2019. In fact, if you deleted our whole corporate back office, that still wouldn't be enough to make the savings. So I think combining authorities, combining IT services is a valid way forward. It will achieve some of the savings that we need to achieve, but it won't do everything, not, not by a long way. And also the first two that merge, if you think about it, you save 50% of the costs between you, you share 50% of the savings. What does the third get, or well, the fourth, or the fifth, maybe a third, or a quarter, or a 20%? You know, some of those models we're really still going to work through. So, Oh yeah, and another approach we're taking is spin-outs. Um, I think a lot of different authorities are doing this, so two examples I'll give you from, from Newham at the moment are the language shop. That's um, something that reports to the Antics, actually, so I know very well. That's 51% employee owns now. Uh, about 70% of his business is outside of the council. It's sharing what it does with other authorities. But of course, they're taking their technology with them and they're reusing that. So it's another way of reusing the technology. They've got a really nice engine that allows them to take bookings, allocate the work to people who aren't permanent employees. There's a big pool of people, so they can go up and demand, up and down with, uh, with demand. That's another way of coping with Eddie. Um, and, and then they've got optimised BI around that. Uh, the next one that's going out is pest control. And interestingly, there we've gone and we found what Enfield did with Total Mobile as a technology solution. So, well, why not? Why not use that? Uh, and the response there is, yeah, great, looks like it'd be what we need. 
So again, they're spinning off so they can share their costs across multiple organizations. So another approach to sharing the cost of sharing services. But I guess the bit I'm most excited about at the moment in London, uh, is the approach we're taking. So this is the CIO community in London working together with the procurement community in particular. Uh, and we're looking at things that we do jointly, which we think can be done more effectively if we did them together. Uh, the one I've been leading on, or one I've been prioritising the most, is uh, the customer services technologies, the things that enable channel share. Uh, so New and Haven have got a lot of investment in this area, and it's worked very, very well. I mean, New has got, I think, the third poorest demographics in the country. Actually, that changed just recently, thankfully, in, in the right direction, but nonetheless, uh, very young, very multicultural, challenging in, in many respects to get people online and, and using council services. Haven, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, actually. Um, a little wealthier, but much older, the oldest demographics in London. So with both of those cases, it's a matter of putting technologies in place and finding effective ways to communicate with residents. Uh, we've done that to the degree, degree that there are 65% of all transactions in Europe are now online self-service. So we've made some really good advances and uses of those technologies. But it's frustrating to me to see other people building the same thing from scratch, particularly as I'm about to iterate some of those technologies, so the portable technology, the website, some of the integration, and I have to pay to redo that. Now, the business case, the first time, is pretty easy, actually, when you go from face-to-face -to, -face to online. But actually, the business case to just renew the technologies is cost avoidance, I guess, primarily, and it's much more difficult. So what I'd like to do is take those existing assets and find a way of sharing them with other authorities so they can share the ongoing costs with, with the parish that I'm working on. And we tried some of this in the past, we've had some success, we've redeployed it in other authorities, but it's quite tough actually to lift and drop a whole set of infrastructure and, and build it up. And I think cloud gives us a great opportunity, particularly in, in, in the London context, with 33 boroughs that do essentially the same thing with the same sorts of members of residents, to pool our assets. So what we're working on with Microsoft in this case, because I do believe in working with the private sector effectively, is to take the things that Newham, and Enfield, and Croydon, and a number of others boroughs have developed, so all the capabilities that we've got to do redesigned processes, better service delivery, more online, better BI, <coughs> to take those capabilities, put them online into a shared place, so that actually as long as we maintain the standards, which sort of got interoperability, any borough that wants to use it can hook into it. And we'll have some sort of agreement where they'll pay towards the next upgrade, they'll take um, the capabilities that they've got and put them in the pot as well. Well, that's quite exciting for me. So we can take some really good capabilities from lots of different boroughs, use the power of, of cloud to, uh, to make them shareable. And for me, that has a great opportunity for us to share costs, but also to share those digital assets, the innovations that are being carried out around the country. So that's just one of the things that we're trying to do, to say, here are some things that we do individually, we think we could do better together. Uh, and that leads me on to the, uh, the London super cloud. And, and just to explain that briefly, that's really about saying, well, we've got some existing assets in terms of data centers, we've got a hybrid cloud approach. We want to use Microsoft's cloud, Google's cloud, uh, Amazon's cloud, probably crown commercial hosting, various things like this. How do we re-plug the infrastructure of London um, using, again, the London PSN, again, an asset that we own, the council's own that, uh, to join it up so that anybody can exploit anything in any of our data centres at all those different locations. And I think, I mentioned standardising and simplifying, I think that is really important, but it isn't one size fits all. This is also about enabling choice, competition, and innovation. And I think this, this cloud of clouds approach can help us to do it. So we're building this up in London at the moment, working with some of the near nearby counties as well. Uh, and the idea is that if that does work well, well actually that could, that could scale nationally. And I think that's uh, it's, it's an exciting place to live at the moment. And let's be honest, we've taken the bulk of the easy savings. We have to do more radical service transformation and redesign and do things really very differently in the future. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, uh, the borough-wide property licensing scheme in Newman and, and the way that can then enable us to share some capabilities. So um, a number of years ago, we introduced the first borough-wide property licensing scheme. Uh, and this is where a private sector landlord is, is renting out the property and we want to help to make sure that that housing stock is, is fit for purpose. So we introduced the scheme. Uh, initially, 
we put the online sales service and invited all the landlords to pay us some money and register and go through a, a process of, of registration and demonstrating that they're fit and proper landlords in effect. And a uh, lot of people did that. Interestingly, peaks of demand, we stupidly gave them a 31st of, uh, of, of December deadline, and we had the biggest peak we've ever seen on our website uh, on New Year's Eve with thousands and thousands of people registering. Um, so we made a very peaky website where it wouldn't normally be one, we just about coach with that. Then afterwards, once you've got those legitimate landlords signed up, you go off to the more difficult ones, it's enforcement time. And what we had was a team of people that would go out into the streets, spotting properties based on physical characteristics. Does it look like it's owned by the person who lives there, nice pot plants, <coughs> things like that, or not? And we had around a 50-50% success rate about whether it would be uh, a, a landlord-owned property rented out or not. Uh, and then we started to work out how we do that more intelligently. And we used the fact that all our council systems are joined up, we have a single view across them. Primarily it was a property-based single view, we've moved that onto people-based now as well. Uh, and what we did was we learned over time, what were the indicators? Uh, was it to do with overflowing rubbish bins? Was it to do with calls to the contact centre where perhaps somebody had mentioned the word uh, landlord anywhere in the text? So we looked at lots of different factors, joined them up, and we got to the point now where it's, it's a 99% success rate. Uh, we have way more private sector landlords than we possibly realised was the case when we started doing this and we brought in millions of pounds of income. So we've been doing this for a number of years, we were the front runners in this area, and we've learned, uh, we've learned the hard way in some cases, but there are a load of lessons there that we've learned that we can potentially reuse. As I mentioned earlier, the business intelligence is the key component here to really understand our demographics, to understand when we do enforcement, where should we go, what's the priority, how do we get best bang for buck. Particularly as this is a multidisciplinary uh, group of people that will be descending on these properties. So it led us to think, how do we share in a different way? Shared services, as I mentioned earlier, I think are very important and they have a part to play. But if you think about it, you can only slice a person and resell them across different organisations so many times. What we're looking at here is data analysis as a service. So we're looking to say, if you could provide from your council the data that we need in the right format, we can push them through our engine, use our analytics to say, here are your private sector landlords, here, here is the scale of the issue, Scale of the opportunity, scale of the problem. When you're doing your enforcement, here's where you should go. If you've only got limited capacity, here's how you prioritise it. And we think that's quite an interesting way, potentially, of sharing intellectual property, sharing the capabilities of, a, of an innovative authority that went first. And of course, lots of different authorities can do this for the things that they lead. So, just got a few quick slides here that I'll just whistle through just to give you a flavour of what the, the series is that we're standing at. Uh, and that was the issue, it was the beds and sheds. It was primarily uh, trying to address the issue of really poor quality housing from criminal landlords. So essentially, as I said, this gives us the capability of, of helping an organisation to understand what it's got to work with. Uh, there are reasons why every authority has to do this, they become mandated, uh, and we think we could help make it happen uh, more quickly. Now, You'll get these slides and the deck when it goes out, so I'm not going to dwell upon them. Um, and you can pick them up and share them with colleagues if they're useful. But the main thing I wanted to focus on is, is this another way of doing shared services? Um, potentially even we could pull the enforcement staff. So uh, taking um, Eddie's point about peak demand again, rather than everybody have an enforcement team that goes gradually around every area, we could share them. And every year we could do a different borough, every six months we could pull them. You know, the, the ways of doing things differently based on that intelligence is quite interesting. So if the whole of London shared its, its data in this space, we would know which boroughs we should prioritise, let alone which wards and districts. So I think interesting possibilities. Just quickly flip through these and get to the conclusion slide. Maybe. Maybe not. Oh. Okay, so I think the shared service is becoming the norm. Uh, when I chair the CIO Council in London, we run around the table. I realise frequently we've got twice as many boroughs representatives as I realised, because so many of us are doing uh, two or more boroughs now. Uh, but that is a good thing, as I say, we're sharing costs and we're sharing intellectual uh, capital and, and good practice uh, and assets. So I think it has a place, but there's much more to it. 
Uh, devolution is another driver, of course, that means that we're going to be sharing with other groups of authorities um, on different topics. So we do need to ensure that we have ability. Uh, and again, I believe it provides more opportunities. But the key message I'll leave you with is, is my view um, that, that cloud platforms enable new ways of sharing uh, our costs uh, and our intellectual property and our assets that we've really developed. And that's it for now. And I just, uh, just when you were talking about using cloud or whatever, and you were cit citing some of these private sector providers there, I just wonder if you think there could be any serious issues about being able to do this within their business models and charging structures. But it strikes me that accommodating this won't be one of their priorities at all. They're, they're going to have other things there which could, could, could possibly make it difficult. Yeah, it's a very good point. So some of our vendors, they have current charging models, uh, mechanisms where us sharing our assets really isn't in their interest um, and I think frankly that is going to be difficult for them, they have to evolve their model and, and they will when they have to but until that time they'll keep charging us in the same way they always have. If you take disruptive players in the marketplace or even those that are changing their models, so I'll take Microsoft as an example, they're going to help us, they're going to help uh, financially incentivize, put capacity in to us putting our capabilities into their cloud because that's their future model. Uh, they want to make money out of, of, of services as opposed to just licenses. So I think that's the key is for us to work with those organisations as private sector players where it's a win-win. They can see the benefits to themselves and for us. Uh, some of our legacy systems, frankly, I think those that don't evolve and change their model will effectively push them further back. The back office will go further back. We'll use front ends like Total Mobile increasingly so that people out, out in the field will use a different user interface from that system. Increasing that system will just be a database with some rules in it, and over time we'll probably replace it. So yeah, I think it will be very challenging for some vendors to change their model, and so we have to embrace those that want to do things in a new way with us. Is there a front there? It's a chuckle run. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian Moonpath from uh, Shropshire again. Um, what was the biggest challenge you had with bringing all those authorities together? Was it security or was it something else? So what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome? Because the more people in, in the pie, the, the more difficult the decision making and the ability to get to a consensus. The biggest problem when you interdict with consensus is people. Um, security is relatively trivial, so it's about change management. Um, the technology, why. I mean, this game is relatively straightforward and it's a fantastic enabler. Uh, the challenge is changing people's behaviours, uh, hence some of this, this nudge stuff. Um, and I think some things we've done recently with, for example, transparency. So when you have an online portal, everybody can see uh, status updates. Uh, Felicity mentioned earlier status. That's something that's really transformational for us. Um, because we used to say, <coughs> pothole reported, the status is open, the status is closed. That was really not helpful. So people would ring up and say, well, there's still a pothole, how can it be closed? And the answer was the status should have been, uh, it's not big enough to be a pothole. Uh, it's going to be fixed when we do the whole road in three months' time. There's a whole load of intelligent, user-friendly statuses that are needed. And what we found is when we go around the council looking at what's your SRA, <coughs> some of those that weren't, what's your performance targets, there aren't. So what happens is the contact centre gets the brunt of all these things. And so what we're using is the technology, the transparency, the, the, the data to enable but to force, in some cases, services to reevaluate the way they do things and, uh, and to, to challenge them to do things differently. But coming back to your original point, it, it is about change management. It's about people doing business with people, showing them the opportunities, convincing them over a period of time it's the right thing to do. And I think because a lot of us do work closely together, it's about developing trust in a relationship. Okay. Any more my favourite example of a really crap target that was published by one of our services is trees. Somebody said, there's a tree about four in my house, can you come look at it? And the response was, we will look at this in line with our uh, targets, which is that three to five years on our next survey of your area. I'm thinking, hang on, you're a resident as well as somebody in the service. How can you possibly feel that's a reasonable response? But because that SLA is out there in the public domain now, the resident can challenge it. 
the elected members who use their own version of the report will get to see it and they get to say, hang on, this is ridiculous. So I think that transparency of those performance targets is really important to say to transform the, um, the overall performance of the council. Some more questions for, any more questions for Jeff? Should form one from the front, straight to one in the back? <coughs> I hope she's got a fit there, and we'll do more today. <laughs> uh, Paul Brewer again from Open Worthy. Really, really interesting, Jeff. Um, I think it's, it's really obvious, I think, from what you're doing and saying, how, how your role is changing from essentially a traditional um, IT um, manager and, and, and strategic lead to somebody who's very um, involved in looking at the business model going forward for local government, the business models of the various services you've mentioned. What do you think is the future of a role such as yours and should its scope be extended, do you think, to, to enable us to make uh, the best of the potential for digital business models? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, I think the traditional head of IT role um, Moving from that to the CIO role, or the CDO, or the head of digital services, it is, it's in many respects the change we're talking about here. And I think as we spend less and less time, hopefully, keeping the lights on with our technology as it moves to cloud, uh, it becomes more shared. It's more about uh, a role to evangelise the capabilities of technology to change the business processes. Uh, and I see that as my role. Uh, my role is to support the services. So essentially, we have set digital principles, and they mean that every service manager owns making that digital transformer. And therefore my role is twofold. My role is to help them to understand the art as possible. Uh, and then my, my, my role is to um, support the change process with technology. And I guess if I'm honest, I've got the policing role as well, where I come in from the other end and, and take proxies for bad processes like checks, face-to-face, -face, unstructured email uh, contacts, and those kind of things, and use them to say, well, actually, where have we got bad processes that we should change? But you're absolutely right. My role is much more about um, developing relationships, um, helping the services to work together, and changing the council's performance by helping to change its operating model. So yeah, I think that's direction travel, and frankly, I find it much more rewarding.